Hello, everybody. So glad that you are back for episode number five of The Sitch with Grant Mitchell. And today we have an awesome show. And I've got to say, I had a wonderful weekend, very relaxing. Got to take in a very high level of sports over the weekend, some NBA games, some boxing matches, which we might talk about just a little bit towards the end of the show. Really good weekend to be Grant Mitchell, to be honest. Got to go out Sunday night, had a very nice dinner. Went to an American sort of steakhouse, but believe it or not, when you go to those places, you might think that the burgers and the wings and all that stuff are the main attraction on the menu. Their steak, they lived up to their name. Got this charred steak. It was amazing. The fat melted in your mouth. Normally, I cut the fat off my steaks. I know I'm that guy, but this one was too good to pass up onto. A little rich, so I woke up this morning feeling a little bit puffier than I should have. But hey, it was definitely worth the meal. Definitely worth the price as well. But let's go ahead. You didn't come here for my food reviews. I'm not that type of person. This isn't Ratatouille. Let's start off with Damian Lillard scoring 71 points and making 13 threes against the Houston Rockets. Now, the Trailblazers won 131 to 114. There was a point in the fourth quarter where it was about 10 points away, but the game didn't really finish that close. Towards the end of the game, all of the Blazers were just chucking Dame the ball, telling him to heave it up there. He left, like I said, with 71 points. This was a career high for him, both in terms of points made and three-pointers made. It ties him with Donovan Mitchell for most points in a single game this season and ties him for eighth in the all-time list with David Robinson and Elgin Baylor. David Robinson, if you remember, was locked in a scoring battle. I believe it was with Shaq. And going into that final game of the season, I think if it was Shaq, memory doesn't fail me, Shaq had already played. And so David Robinson knew that he needed to score 71 points. Or maybe they were playing at the same time and David Robinson knew he was going to have to score a lot. But whatever the case, the Spurs just gave him the ball the entire game, and that's how he's got a 71. This was actually within the flow of the game for Dame. Now, again, they were looking for him, but he had 41 points at half, and he had eight threes. That eight three two. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. He comes across the timeline in transition, still on the logo. Logos have gotten bigger these days, so logo threes aren't quite what they used to be, but the Trailblazers logo is fairly small. This shot was, I want to say, 36 feet with a defender draped all over him. They were picking him up, him up from half court. They were playing box and one a lot of the game. There was even one possession where they played a triangle in two. If you don't know what that is, it means you're running a one-two zone with two people face guarding Dame. That's how hot he was. But yeah, this guy is just unbelievable. Um, one of the first things that I do want to talk about, actually, before we get into it, well, we'll start with Dane and his MVP case. Now, it's not great. We're gonna, we're, we know Nikola Jokic and Joel Embiid are winning that award. It's going to be one of them. Giannis is in third. You've got guys like Luka, Ja, uh, even Steph, LeBron, uh, Booker. There's a whole lot of players that you would put up there, if not level with Dame ahead of Dame. But over his last two, his last 22 games, he has been sensational. 38 points and 7.1 assists per night on over 51% from the field and 40.1% from three-point territory. That is just unreal, especially the three-point percentage for a guy who's creating his own shot and is a high-volume three-point shooter. That is just unreal, and it's really reminiscent of those days where you know, you look at the three-point shootout and it would be Steph versus Clay, Steph versus Clay, and everybody was always wondering, well, how does Dame stack up against these guys? He, every once in a while, he has these performances where he lets you know he is still just as good as he ever has been. Now, as far as his MVP hopes go on the sports books, they don't really know where to place him. Saw him at, at as low as plus 15,000 on Caesars today and as high as plus 49,000. I believe that was on FanDuel. Now, most sports books do have him right around eighth, but the actual odds value that you could get for him is up in the air. Now, some interesting notes about his chances to win the MVP. The worst record that an MVP winner has had in the last 48 years, the cutoff being Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, was Russell Westbrook in the 2016-17 season. I want to say that his team was 47 and 35, or 40, 46 and 35 when he played, maybe I think was the case. And they were the sixth seed. Nikola Jokic won the MVP last year, also is the sixth seed. Right now, Dame's Blazers are in 11th. And to be honest, I don't love their chances of getting into the conference or the Western Conference playoffs, but they are only a half game behind the New Orleans Pelicans in 10th. So it's certainly within reach. 
I don't think they have a chance of climbing up into the six seed, which based on that precedent would be the mark to actually get him into the MVP conversation. And I really don't think he will MVP, but his odds are surging and he's playing outstandingly well. There is really no doubt about that. He's just one of the best that this game has ever seen, to be honest. One thing that I was thinking about to myself is where do we rank Damian Lillard all time amongst the greatest players in NBA history? Now, we know that he made the NBA's 75th anniversary team, which means that the NBA officials, the NBA itself, think he's one of the 75 greatest players to ever play the game. And I don't think anybody can refute that. But one of his biggest problems and one of his biggest challenges once he retires and how he'll be remembered in the history books is that he doesn't have a championship and he probably never will win one. And that's not an indictment of him. It's it's a reflection of his loyalty to the city of Portland, a city that the organization has never been fantastic. They haven't brought in players that are capable of going to that championship and winning it. They've brought in decent players, you know, the Jeremy Grants of the world. They had CJ McCollum back there for a while. They make moves, but none of them are just quite good enough to get them over the hump. And in the era of ring culture, where everybody's all about count the rings, if you have zero rings, it's going to be really hard for you to climb up that list. Now, in his defense, Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, they're looked at as sort of universal top 20, at the very worst, top 30 players. So it's possible Dame's going to get in there, but then he's also going to have to contend with somebody like James Harden, who right now is in that same spot of having never won a championship before. And when you look at Dame, when he got to the Western Conference Finals, he got swept by the Warriors. And if I'm not mistaken, his team had a double digit, was it double digit or just a regular lead? I know they were up in the fourth quarter of every game in that Western Conference Finals, which they ended up losing. And that was the year that they could have gone to the finals and actually made some noise, too, because the Warriors were a little vulnerable as far as the Warriors during their dynastic stages go. So that's the one real big hindrance of his case. But it's a shame. I hope he's remembered for the player that he is. I personally have not made a list. I would probably off the top of my head say he's a top 40 player. Haven't really considered if I could put him in the top 30, but I'm going to guess that there's an argument you, argument you could make. But anyway, amazing performance. Um, just a couple other numbers that I didn't throw out there. He was 22 of 38 from the field, well over 50%. 13 of 22 from three, that's 59%. 14 of 14 from the free throw line, obviously that is 100%. He had a true shooting percentage of 80.4. That is the best ever in a game in which a player has scored 71 or more points. Obviously, it's better than Donovan Mitchell's, who was 78 point something, can't quite remember it at this time. That's going to do it for Dame, though. Awesome night. However, my favorite game, that was my favorite performance to watch, my favorite game to watch from the weekend, undoubtedly the Los Angeles Lakers coming back from 27 points down to beat the Dallas Mavericks 111 to 108 on the road in Dallas. Now, this win, it's one win of 82. I understand but it validates everything that the Lakers did at the trade deadline because they are not winning this game with that old roster they had. The closest thing that you can remember, if you think back to when they played the Celtics in Los Angeles, they were down huge, and then they come roaring back. They're playing incredible defense. LeBron, AD, Westbrook are coming up with a steal every possession, it feels like. They go up well over double digits. And then they throw it away. The game ends up going to overtime and they lose the game. That was the closest they got to this enormous turnaround against a a high caliber team. And they lost that game. 27 points down. That's tied their largest deficit of the entire season. And it marks the biggest comeback victory in Lakers organizational history since 2002. I don't know if you remember that team, but there were a couple of fellas named Kobe Bryant, and Shaquille O'Neal on that squad. So that's really impressive for them. Jared Vanderbilt, I've got to say, I did not see this coming, but Jared Vanderbilt has been the difference for this team. Uh, Looking at that game, his fingerprints were figuratively and literally all over it. He finished the night with 15 points, 17 rebounds. 17 rebounds. He shot 75% from the field. He made his only three he attempted. He made both of the free throws he attempted. He had four steals 
and he forced a huge turnover near the end of the game. The Lakers were up three. Obviously, the Mavericks can come back and hit a three to tie. They've got Luka. They've got Kyrie. You're certainly not going to count them out from doing that, making a clutch shot. 15.1 seconds. Whoever it was inbounds the ball. Was it Luka who inbounded it? No, somebody threw it to Luka. I don't remember who inbounded it, but someone threw it into Luka. Jared Vanderbilt made a, gr made a great beat on the ball, knocked it out of his hands. Luka had to slap it back across the timeline to make sure it wasn't a backcourt violation. Anthony Davis comes up with it, misses his first free throw, but ends up making the second. Lakers go up by four points. And from that point on, it was plain sailing to the end. So Jared Vanderbilt, although he didn't single-handedly win that game, you can argue he made the biggest play of the game to ensure that they had the opportunity to go up two scores late. Another player who was awesome in that game won Anthony Davis. 30 points, 15 rebounds. Had a couple of awesome off-the-dribble turnaround shots. He had one where he completely shook his defender. And then at the end of the game, he had a mismatch in the post. They came with the double, but it was just a little too late. He had a nice fall away from the, from the sideline, about a 10, 15-footer or so. That put the Lakers up three, which came right before Jared Vanderbilt's turnover, obviously. And that's how they won the game. So he was awesome. Um, he also had three blocks, which I failed to mention. LeBron, LeBron has not been shooting the ball terribly effectively lately, lately, but he had 26 points and eight rebounds. You're never going to argue with that. Dennis Schroeder was a team high plus 17. He had 16 points and eight assists. This is how you know the Lakers are a real team. The plus minuses in the starting lineup are plus 16, plus 14, plus 17, and plus 15 and zero. You know who the zero was? It was LeBron. LeBron was the zero in there. Now, obviously, they're not losing when he's on the court, but they're not winning when he's on the court either. And they still came back from 27 down to beat the fifth seed in the Western Conference, now the sixth seed, on their home court. That's unbelievable. It's a testament to the job that Rob Palenka did at the deadline. Again, I think there's still a very good argument that waiting this long sort of screwed the season and you would have been better off with Buddy Hill and Miles Turner. But to his credit, he brought in guys that have completely changed this roster. And D'Angelo Russell isn't playing. You know, he has that sprained ankle. Hopefully he comes back soon for those guys, which is going to be even more important for reasons we're about to discuss. But they're getting it done with just Beasley and Vanderbilt as the newcomers in this lineup. They also only had 16 points off the bench, and those came from three players. Mo Bamba didn't make a shot. Lonnie Walker didn't make a shot. It was Austin Reeves with nine, Troy Brown with five, Rui Hachimura with two. By the way, Hachimura's got to feel a little hard done by because he was getting close to 30 minutes a night when he first came over, and obviously he was starting. He only logged 11 minutes in that win over the Mavericks, had just the two points. He is really falling down the pecking order sort of quickly, which is unfortunate because he was making a difference. But I must say, I do like him and Troy Brown Jr. as the cavalry in the front line off of the bench. I think they work well. Mo Bamba obviously also getting in there with some spacing and shot blocking. Now let's talk about why the Lakers really do need D'Angelo Russell to hurry up and get back. LeBron James injured his foot, foot ankle. We're not quite sure but looks like it's a foot in the third quarter he ended up finishing the game but while he was laying on the ground he said that he heard a pop in his foot now LeBron can be the king but he can also be the drama king or the drama queen if you will so maybe he might not have heard a pop this is the second or third time I can remember him saying I heard a pop off the top of my head one was the groin one was the ankle when the Solomon Hill infamous incident so, you know, to, uh, he didn't lie before. Both those times he was sidelined for quite some period of time. Maybe he is due for another stint on the injury report, although he said he really wanted to play the final 23 games post-All-Star break. Here's my take. I think if LeBron can play, he will. Now, as I say that, I don't think he's going to play the next game. But as long as it's not a long-term injury, I think he will be back the game after that. Like that, like I said, the Lakers really got to hope D'Angelo Russell can come back, especially if LeBron misses that next game. I haven't checked the injury report. I don't know if D'Angelo Russell's in contention for being back for next game, but if he is, that would really be really helpful for them. These Lakers, man, they've got a chance. I want to read you a tweet from Mark Jones. If you guys don't know who Mark Jones is, he is a game announcer for ESPN. He's been around in, in the sports basketball industry for a long time. He tweeted Sunday night, Final thoughts on Lakers versus Mavs from calling it courtside. If the Lakers get in, somebody's going to get their feelings hurt. They're a problem. 
Today spoke volumes without D'Lo too. Look at Vanderbilt's stat line. It tells you all you need to know. He is right. It tells you all you need to know. These Lakers, man, they are scary. You cannot just look at their record and that assume that's the team you're getting. They're only 29 and 32 on the season, and they are 12th in the Western Conference. They are 13 and a half games out of first place, but they are legitimately good. Another player real quick, or another quote rather, from a former player, Jason Kidd, head coach of the Dallas Mavericks, former assistant on the Lakers, obviously a Hall of Fame player, said Vanderbilt kicked our ass after the game. Very complimentary of this team. These guys can go far. Now, to how far can they go? Well, here's the thing. They are one game out of the last spot in the play-in tournament. The Pelicans are in 10th. They are in 12th. Pelicans are 12 and a half out of first. Lakers are 13 and a half out of first. They are only two games out of the seven seed. Now, the seven seed would still be in the play-in tournament, but that puts you right on the bubble of moving up to the six seed, which they are two and a half games behind. All of that is attainable. Those are not big gaps. Those are not insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination. Hell, they are, what, three and a half games out of the four seed. It's not a big gap, once again. But here's the problem. If you want to get to the sixth seed, which Darvin Ham said is the team's goal, you have to pass the Blazers, the Pelicans, the Timberwolves, the Jazz, the Warriors, and the Mavericks. So that's six teams that you have to leapfrog to get to the sixth seed. So theoretically, could they close a two and a half game gap? Absolutely. But other teams are going to win games too, which is something you've got to remember. Can they get past six teams? I don't quite think so. I think this team is going to finish either eighth or ninth, and they're going to be in the play-in. They would love to be the eighth seed because in that case, you only have to win one game in the play-in, whereas if you're the nine, you have to defeat the 10, and then you have to defeat the loser of the seven and eight. So you really want to get up into that seven, eight spot if you have to go through the play-in. But yeah, Lakers look good. Well, another team in Los Angeles. That doesn't look that great, however. The Clippers, they lost to the Denver Nuggets. 124 to 134 in overtime. They are now 0-2 since bringing in Russell Westbrook. Obviously, he came over from the Lakers. He was briefly traded to the Jazz, but ultimately got bought out and signed with the Clippers. Now, while the Lakers were coming back from 27 down, the Clippers got off to a slow start. They started to bring it back at the end, but ultimately Jokic was just way too much for them. By the way, what an unbelievable season. I know I have my gripes with Jokic, mostly when it comes to history and precedent, but I have made it very clear that he is my obvious MVP pick for this season. He had 40 points, 17 rebounds, 10 assists, only one turnover. Guy was unreal. 14 of 21 from the field. There's just not a whole lot you can do for that. Now, the Clippers, the game high was 33 from Kawhi Leonard. He has been scoring very well lately, which has surprised me, especially considering they just went to double overtime the other day. But yeah, his last games, 33 points, 44, 16, not great, 33, 18, not great, but then 24 and 35, 33, 32, 27, 25, 30, 36, 27, 30, 24, 33, 29. His consistency has been great, especially for a guy who is known for inconsistency. So got to give credit where credit is due. He's a major reason as to why the Clippers are such a dangerous postseason threat. And that might sound obvious when you hear the name Kawhi Leonard, but he's been gone for so long and the injuries have taken such a toll on him that a lot of the times you're unsure what you're going to get from him. If you're getting this version of Kawhi Leonard, you are going to be just fine. Let me tell you, Paul George was next on the team with 23 points. Although surprisingly, he was a team high minus 18. Not good at all for those guys. But while those two might dominate most of the headlines, our headline is Russell Westbrook. And I don't want to pick on Westbrook per se, but I want to pick on the Clippers for making the decision to bring Westbrook in. I questioned this from the beginning. I said that this is a team that is so used to inconsistency and you're finally getting some back. Kawhi is healthy and he's staying in the lineup. Paul George is healthy and he's staying in the lineup. You've got a slew of wings you can put in there. You have good role players. You have a good head coach. You have good bigs. Why would you bring in Westbrook and just mess all of that up? And to recap my very brief thoughts on it, if you stick him on the bench, he's going to pout. If you put him in the starting lineup on the ball, he's going to turn it over. If you put him in the starting lineup off the ball, he's going to miss his threes and most of his shots for that matter. He's not even great of a great finisher around the rim anymore. Well, let's look at how I've how my prognostications 
have been going so far. He shot the ball fairly well, to his credit. 23 of 20, or excuse me, 13 of 23. That's over 50%. 33% from beyond the arc. It's above what he was shooting with the Lakers, but it's still not good. Nine turnovers in two games, nine fouls in two games. That's not good. Now, he does have six steals in two games, which is good. But so you can say maybe those fouls and the steals sort of offset one another. But he got benched for the fourth quarter and overtime of this Nuggets game, which I found very interesting because his numbers weren't even that bad. They were actually good in that game. In that Nuggets game, he had 17 points, five boards, four assists, five steals, 60% from the field, 50% from three in 25 minutes. Those are all-star numbers. And he got benched in the fourth quarter in overtime. It goes back to my whole theory or my whole question of why would you bring Westbrook in? My, I didn't understand what they were hoping to get out of him, what they thought he could bring that they didn't already have, what he could contribute that wasn't already present on the roster. If you look at his game against the Nuggets, again, he played very well. 17-5-4 with five steals in 25 minutes, 60% from the field, and that's not enough to earn him, earn him minutes in the fourth quarter or overtime. What are the Clippers going to do with him? How are you going to expect him to play any better than that? Because he was awesome, and he doesn't get back in the game. Now, is it a coincidence they're 0-2 since bringing him in? I don't know. The first game he was there for the Kings, we didn't talk about it because we were off for the weekend. But my God, if you didn't see that game, it finished 176 to 175 in double overtime. It was the second highest scoring game in NBA history. Westbrook had 17 points. He had 14 assists, five rebounds, but he had six fouls, which means he fouled out, obviously. And he had seven turnovers, and the Kings won, and the Clippers lost by one point. It's just unfortunate. Now, their problems stretched back to before Westbrook showed up. They were 0-4. Oh, no, I lied. Excuse me. I'm looking at Westbrook's game log. He is 0-4 in his last four games, but the Clippers are not. They won their last two games before he got to town. So what are we going to get from them moving forward? I still think they're a good team. I don't think they're going to fall into the play-in tournament, but I think they have a hard cap of the second round of the playoffs would not at all be surprised if they lost in the first round of the playoffs unless they significantly reduce Westbrook's minutes. I'm talking 15 minutes or less, and he can't play in the final stretches of the game. It's not an indictment against Westbrook the human. He's an awesome guy. It's an indictment on his play style and how his skills have evolved. You get someone like LeBron. LeBron was very reliant on his athleticism early in his career. So now he, he was also very smart, which helped a lot but he didn't have a nice touch from the mid range or from three didn't shoot threes very well. And a lot of what he did on offense and defense was his athleticism. Now LeBron is still big and strong and he can still run pretty fast. He doesn't really jump that high anymore. His lateral quickness is faded on defense, but he has such a good touch. Now he can deliver passes from different angles. He can fire passes across the court to three pointers. He can dump it inside. He can get hot and make eight, nine threes in a game. He has stretches where he'll go 10 of 10 from the free throw line. That's balanced by his downswings, obviously. But it's the fact that there are those upswings are there that's allowed him to age gracefully. Westbrook doesn't have that. He can't make threes consistently. He can't make free throws consistently. He's sort of a one-trick pony in many ways. And that trick that he has, it's fading. It's not as effective as it once was. So sad to see it because I absolutely loved watching him play when he was at his prime. But he's just not that guy anymore. And the Clippers, they are starting to feel the effects of it, which sucks for them, but it was their own doing. Our final story of the day that we're going to talk about is not about basketball. And for the first time in the sitch with Grant Mitchell, we are going into the boxing ring. We're going to go and step on the canvas. We are going to talk about Tommy Fury beating Jake Paul via split decision in their fight in Saudi Arabia. Now, Jake Paul is now 6-1 and one as a professional. Fury is 9-0. and oh. He said he wants to win a world championship. His opponents, his previous opponents' records really weren't that great. They were something like 30 and 300 with combined. Not good at all. Not what you would expect to see from a future world champion. And based on the eye test, Tommy Fury does not look like a future world champion. 
and I, I'm just going to say this right now. I am not a boxing expert. I'm not a boxing savant. I have grown into the sport over the last five to seven years or so. And I would like to say that I know more than the average sports watcher, but I'm sure there are people watching who know about more about boxing than I do. So as far as technique analysis goes and all that, let me know if I'm wrong or just hold your own opinions to yourself and realize, take this as a disclaimer that I don't know the more about boxing than everybody else. Would never claim to. Paul had Tommy Fury down on the ground in the eighth and final round with a left-handed jab. It was really sort of a balance thing and a timing. Fury was sort of swooping to his left and he was changing levels as Paul struck him with that jab. Really, I mean, Fury was up within a second, if that, maybe a half of a second, just bounced right back to his feet. It, he looked sad that he lost the point more than anything. He wasn't hurt by the blow at all. What I saw from that fight was that Jake Paul was not playing on the outside, but he was trying to fight almost like a counter puncher a lot of the time. But when his counters weren't hitting, which was a lot of the time, he was getting counter counter punched. Tommy Fury was very sharp. He was also paying a lot more attention to his defense. No real head movement from Jake Paul. Not a lot of parries. Very stationary target. There wasn't a lot of angle switches unless they were close by and exchanging blows. I also thought Tommy Fury was in there and able to get in there with a lot more combinations, whereas Jake Paul was looking at a lot more swooping hooks and some overhands. Now, Jake was landing some power shots, which was his whole game plan. We know he wants to be a knockout artist. We've seen the devastation that he has in his right hand with what he's done to Nate Robinson, what he did to Tyron Woodley, what he's done to all these guys that he's faced so far. But Tommy Fury, to his credit, he just kept getting up and getting up. Well, not even getting up. He only got knocked down that one time. He was just well, coming back, coming back, walking forward, coming back. Jake would stand still and throw the counter punch. Fury would stand there and counter punch with him, and he would outbox him. It was a real difference between hunting a knockout blow, which is what Jake Paul was doing, and chopping down a tree, which is what Tommy Fury was doing. Now, Jake looked like he could have fought another couple of rounds if he wanted to, as did Tommy Fury. But I think the eight-round spot was good for them. The level of performance was slowly declining, and it was very clear they were on the edge of it dropping into a chasm. You know, if this was a 12-round fight, by the end of it, it would have gotten really ugly. A couple times they looked punch drunk, but they kept getting back in there and exchanging. Two warriors, two really, two guys who really fought their hearts out. It was good to see. I personally was surprised that Paul lost. I thought he was going to be able to knock Fury out. Haven't seen a whole lot of impressive stuff from Fury in his career. He's good, obviously. I'm not saying he's not impressive as a fighter, but in terms of his ambition of wanting to be a world champion, I haven't seen that out of him. But he showed a lot of heart in this fight, and he clearly outboxed Jake Paul. Jake Paul's put a lot into boxing and moved to Dubai. He was training with Badu Jack, you know, guy who was also appeared on that card right before him. So he was all in on this, and he ended up losing. Now, I don't know if Jake Paul is going to honor the wager that he had with Fury, which was at the press conference the day before the fight, I wanted to say. Might have been a couple of days before, but I think it was the day before. He said that if he lost, he would pay Tommy Fury twice as much as he was already paying him. But if Fury lost, then Fury had to give Paul his entire purse. Obviously, we know the outcome of the fight, so I don't know if Jake's going to be a man of his word and give him double. But the two shared pleasantries after the fight. Jake looked very dejected, like he didn't really want to talk to Fury, which is understandable. He wasn't necessarily mad at him. I think he was mad at himself. A big loser on the day was Drake, who bet $400,000 that Jake Paul would have won by knockout. He stood to gain $1.4 million if that came true. Not only did not Jake not get the knockout, we know he didn't even win it all. Tyson Fury, again, Tommy's half-brother, joked after the fight that he and Drake were two losers because Tyson had bet on Tommy to win by knockout, which did not happen. But I'm sure you'd rather be Tyson in this instance and have your half-brother win the fight than lose on the big stage. It was a fun match. Jake Paul has said a couple of times on social media already that he was ready to get back in the ring. He also said that he wants a rematch. I haven't looked at the contract out of clauses. I don't know if there's a rematch clause in there, and we'll see these two back in there. But I do hope we see both of them again relatively soon. Obviously, take your time. Go home. Tommy has a newborn baby with his, his missus. I don't know if they're married or not. But they need to spend their time together. Jake needs to get recover from the fight, obviously, and then get back in the lab, get back to training. Don't know if he wants to actually fight KSI or not. Don't know if he wants to fight later this year like they've been talking about online. But we will see eventually. It's going to be a, wherever Jake goes, that's where the money goes. That's where the eyes go. Let's be real. That's all it is at the end of the day. And that's all it is at the end of the day on this episode of The Sitch with Grant Mitchell. A little bit of a quicker one in and out within a half hour. 
Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Until then, have a great day.